into another realm. But we know that Adam and Eve did die. And we do know that sadly death is something which we have to deal with. When my first grandparent passed away, that was extremely hard. But God gives us the strength, the energy, and the courage because death is just a sleep. Christ gave us the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption, mankind sinned. Jesus came to save us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we could spend eternity with Jesus. Romans 6 verse 23. And the thing is, I, I was at a funeral service once. I was in New Zealand. I was staying with some friends and the person had to conduct the funeral service. And I find I could go to anybody's funeral service and I still get emotional. I might not even know the person. That's just how I am. And I said to him, how do you able to control your emotions so well? And he said, he explained the person just going to sleep. You know, you're celebrating their, their life. They're going to sleep and the next thing they'll see is Jesus coming. But Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've ever taken the time to walk around the corner to St. Mary's Church here in Lutterworth, you'll see a big mural, a big painting there, which is of Christ's second coming. People which are being raised from the grave. I'm not saying it's how I imagine it, but that painting was painted maybe a few hundred years ago, and it's how the artist imagined it then. But the lie, Lewis had this lie. Lewis was said, if you sin and take the fruit, you're not going to die, you're going to live forever. But we see this continued lie. We see some beliefs out there. Once saved, always saved. Have you heard that belief? I, I laugh at this. It was sad. I had a colleague at work. He was a Christian. And I said to him, as his wife had an affair with someone else. And we know in the Bible it says about not having affairs. And we know if we don't repent from our sins, then we won't live with Jesus for eternity. So I said to this fellow Christian, that's sad, but the saddest thing is, is her eternity, is her, her eternal life. And do you know what he said? It's okay, she's saved. And I do believe we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But I also believe that unless we repent after we've sinned, we will not have eternal life. Because that doctrine simply means if you take someone like Hitler, if when he was a teenager, he had gone to church and he had been saved once, well, he's going to be saved, isn't he? He's going to be in heaven, despite all those atrocities of killing the six million Jews. I'm not here to judge Hitler. I'm leaving that to God. But you know what I'm saying. Then you get other things. Other, th other people say, you can't overcome. You're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. But I believe in the Bible. Do you believe in the Bible? My Bible tells me in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's what the Bible says. Yes, overcoming. Yes, life is hard. But with Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus won't force me. He won't do everything for me. He'll say, Jonathan, I'm here to help you. As we know from Romans 6 verse 23, which we read earlier, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the next question is, what is death? I know we've got a couple of medical people here and I've asked them. They will probably describe and give a definition of 
it's when the heart stops beating. Or maybe they would say when the person's let go of their last breath and the oxygen which is in their blood is used up, then the brain ceases to work. And that is very true from a medical perspective. But what does the Bible say about death? In Psalms 13 verse 3, we read, we've got three texts here, Psalms 13 verse 3, then in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, and then John 11 verse 11 to 14. But let's first read Psalms 13 verse 3. Consider and hear, O Lord my God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Referring to it as a sleep. But we can't just take one Bible text, can we? We need to take many Bible texts to explain other Bible texts. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with thy might. And we could preach a sermon just on that part of the text. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Look at that. No work, no device. There's no knowledge in the grave. There's no wisdom in the grave. And then John 11, verse 11. This reads, These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Those of us which know this Bible account of Lazarus, he died, he was dead, but Jesus referred to Lazarus as asleep. Then his disciples, not understanding, the disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Which is correct, isn't it? If you're ill, sleep is the best thing. But in verse 13, it goes on. How be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And we know the account of Lazarus, that he'd been dead in the grave for how many days? Do you remember, children? Three, it's good, it's good you could remember. It's one reason I'm asking you, because I couldn't remember. I was gonna say two days, three days, four days even, okay, two, three, four. But the point here is, in a warm country, when someone goes into the grave, you don't wanna be talking to them after a couple of days time, because they smell and they're gonna to start to decay. But after four days, Jesus, called forth Lazarus from the dead. Because Jesus has the power over the grave. Lazarus was dead, described as asleep. It is still sad. I pray to God that I could preach this sermon. Because I still get sad about my grandma. I still cry about my grandma, because death is not something to be happy about. Death is something sad. And sometimes it's easier for us to clinically look at death. Adam and Eve, they mourned the death of a dying leaf. As this began to show the magnitude of their sins. It is only natural for us to be sad when someone goes to sleep. You'll miss them. But if you can stop and pause, in my case with my grandma, I will miss her. She's been with me for all my life. But to know that she rests, to know by God's grace that when the roll is caught up yonder, she will be there. To know that she'll no longer be in this suffering world. That is something to give me joy. 
to know that my grandma is looking forward to walking through the pearly gates is something which gives me joy. Something which gives me joy to be able to stand here today and still do God's work. Because this is what God expects of us. This is what my grandma expects of me. Whatever the cost might be, we've got a work to do for our Savior. You may sit there thinking, one of my relatives passed away. Will my relative be saved? In my grandma's case, I pray she is, but I leave the judging to God. But you know the amazing thing about Jesus? If you could walk into an earthly court, maybe the judge making the judgment doesn't like people. Maybe doesn't like preachers, so they're going to be harsh on the subject. Maybe they don't like dentists or vets or whatever. Hope you've never been to court. But the difference with Jesus the judge, he wants to do everything possible that the person being judged is saved. You may sit there and think, well, my relative was not even a Christian. They even didn't even know who God was. God will judge mercifully. God will judge and do everything possible so that person will be saved. There's one thing. When you look at a child, you can see a child, maybe a child has grown up in a family which aren't Christians. And maybe the child can see another child maybe bullying another child and that child will say, that's not nice. That's wrong. Why on earth does that child think it's wrong for this other child to bully another child? Not brought up with the Bible. Not brought up with the Christian principles. Because it's still instilled in us as a human race. We still know what's right or wrong. Many people, there's different beliefs out there. Some people believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven. Some people believe in eternal hell. That those which have been bad, they're going to burn forever. Some people believe that when you die, you rest until Jesus comes. But I want to look at each one of those. Is it biblical to say that when you die, you go straight to heaven? So many times you hear these things. You hear people saying these. Before we ask, answer that question, I want you to imagine this. I imagine you walk out here outside the church doors. You turn to your left and you see that a child is about to run across the road and there's a big car coming fast. You shout, the child can't hear you. You see that child run across the road and it's hurt at the best. How do you feel? Was that a happy experience? Do you feel agitated? Do you feel, if only I could have shouted louder to stop that? Can you imagine your relative being in heaven, watching you suffering? Watching you, maybe looking down upon you, going through the problems, the pains of life, and cannot do a thing to help? Will's it is a nice thought in one way to think that grandma or mum or whoever it might be is in heaven with Jesus. And you can understand why people like to think that. I perfectly understand it. But maybe the biblical teaching which says when they go into the grave they are resting and asleep until Jesus comes is so much nicer. We haven't got time and I don't have the Bible text down here. Maybe another day I can do Christ's second coming. But imagine Christ's second coming. Imagine being reunited with your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife. And imagine spending that time 
being reunited with Jesus. This is the interesting thing. If you walk around some of the older graveyards, the older graveyard says, resting until Jesus comes. A lot of the newer ones will say, in heaven with grandma, or whatever it may be. But the Bible teaches that death is asleep. I have a friend. I may send a link to the sermon to my friend, close friend. He used to believe, but he could never understand the belief. He used to believe that if you had sinned and you didn't follow Jesus, that you were going to burn in hell for eternity. Because that's what some Christians believe. And he questioned that. And he said, whilst he was a faithful Christian, he constantly was thinking, how can a loving God allow this person to be tortured for eternity in hell? Valid question. In Revelation 1 verse 18, we read these words. I am he that liveth and was dead. It's Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. Said by Jesus himself. And this reads. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold... I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus controls. But this talks about hell, doesn't it? Okay. And this is the thing. Notice when I said earlier, when I was talking about death being asleep, I said we can't rely on one Bible text. And I gave you three Bible texts reiterating about death is asleep. But this is talking about hell. So we can stop the sermon now, we can walk away, have lunch, and I can tell you that hell exists. Okay. But I ask the question here, would a loving God allow someone to be in hell burning forever? I don't believe a loving God would, would do that. I want you to turn your Bibles now to Jude, chapter one, verse seven. A little bit harder fight, Jude, but you find Revelation and then work forwards in the Bible, you'll find the book of Jude. But here we find this book talking, this reference talking about eternal fire. So eternal fire does exist. So if eternal fire exists just by reading the words, then surely eternal hell should exist. Follow my logic so far? Just the logic I'm sharing with you, it makes sense so far. Jude 1 verse 7, this reads, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. If we read about Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that God destroyed the cities because of their sinfulness by fire. Eternal fire. Does anybody know where Sodom and Gomorrah were, was geographically? I had to Google this. I knew roughly where it would be. Does anybody know? I'll tell you what I found. Historically, Sodom and Gomorrah are possibly located under or adjacent to the shallow waters south of Alisan, a former peninsula in the central part of the Dead Sea in Israel. Now this was written, oh I'm, I'm having to guess here, probably about 3,000 years ago when Sodom and Gomorrah were, was burnt down. Is there any city in the world which is still burning? Burning for eternity. But does that city still exist? No. Eternal consequences of the eternal fire. And that is the interesting thing there. If the Bible is using the language of eternal fire, and that city no longer exists, then it answers the question about eternal hell. Hell will be the consumption until burnt. Yes, not a pleasant experience, but the wages of sin is death. 
However, a loving God will not have eternal hell. So the question is, why not send everybody to heaven? Okay? Why not just have everybody to be saved? Good question, right? Wouldn't we just repeat exactly what happened here on planet Earth? Planet Earth, sin came, and we see the misery in this country, in this Earth. Also, from another perspective, have you ever gone somewhere or done something which you find extremely boring? I, my friend and I, we were traveling around in America, and some people get excited about the weirdest things. And we were staying in this health retreat, and they asked us, do we want to go to the, the not making lecture? And we thought we'd be polite. And we went, and they were getting all excited about different knots you could make, and you know, all how useful they may be, and everybody's their own. There's nothing wrong with knots. But my friend and I were just so bored, and we were like amused at how people could, could be so interested in such a boring subject. And guess who they chose to be volunteers? My friend and I. Imagine spending eternity being bored. Those people who want to follow Jesus will love heaven. And I'm looking forward to heaven. But we'll be resting, those which pass away before Jesus comes, we'll be resting until Jesus comes. In John 14, verse 3, we're first looking at John chapter 14, verse 3. This is where we see where Jesus has gone and how nice this sounds. John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. How much I'm looking forward to spending time in heaven. How much I'm looking forward to being reunited with my grandma, walking through the pearly gates, and she'll be reunited, I pray, with her parents and her grandparents, and I'll be able to meet my grand great-grandparents, which I never met. How amazing that is. John chapter 1, verse 7. Talking about Christ's second coming. John chapter 1 and verse 7. Whilst death is a sad subject, once we understand it, once we've got overcome the initial grieving period, how exciting the next stages are. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. He cometh in great clouds of glory. And then moving on to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57, or 58 even. This is just so exciting, just so amazing. 1 Corinthians, Acts, Romans, Corinthians. This is where Christ shows the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, incor this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this shall mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Listen to this. You may have had loved ones pass away. Listen to this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Nothing will change you for Jesus. Because Jesus has sealed and settled you into the truth. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's be steadfast, my brothers and sisters, my friends, my family. We have something to look forward to. We have the beauty of meeting our loved ones when Christ comes again. I want to remind you, God is the fairest judge ever in this world. Instead of judging to see how we can be punished, he will judge to see where possible we can be saved. The questions I had, which I asked my grandma, and I asked the question for you today, because life is not guaranteed, is everything good between you and God? If your life was taken today, could you say, Jesus, I'm yours? Is everything good between you and your family members? Maybe your sister, your brother, your husband, your wife. Is everything good between you and others? We've all done wrong things. Have we asked for forgiveness and repented of our sins? One thing in closing with my grandma. This is the interesting thing. My grandma has not been able to swallow for, today is the ninth day, I believe. And when she's not been able to swallow, she's not been able to obviously have food and water. But she's had no medication. Her brain is alert. My sister came over. She, my sister will be at church today, but she's with my grandma. My sister came over, she knew who she was. And last time when she came over, she struggled to remember who she was. She was even asking about my husband's pre my sister's previous husband. And I think she's met him maybe once. I thought there, she's come off the drugs. She's got a clear mind. I know some of us, we need to have the drugs. I'm not here to judge anybody. Because each one of us is going to make our own decision, our own choice in life. But this is something I've seen with my own eyes. As I said to my grandma, I look forward to walking through the pearly gates with her. We need to think of Death as no longer as goodbye, but as waiting for her. As waiting for Jesus to come. May God bless you all.